Good morning, everybody. Hey, I don't have time to be pleasant with you, okay? So I'm glad you're here. I love you. I got a lot of stuff that needs to be said. Are you okay if we just kind of like just, let's just roll with this. I've been making an assumption that I want to clarify today, lock it in, and give us a bit of an anchor as a church. I've said it before, but it's been a while. So we're, a lot of times when I preach, I'll say, let's look at what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's open up the Bible. So we're doing a series about what does the Bible say about Well, there's an assumption in that, is that we care about what the Bible says. I mean, I I know it's kind of like, well, yeah, uh, right. So we need to have a sermon, that's going to be today, about why in the world would we be a church that still uses the Bible? Like, like why use that book? It's old. Uh, There's some grammatical errors in some places on the translation and stuff. You're like, wait a minute, I don't know if we should use that. And let me give you some history and context. I think this is important. I grew up in a family that really, really, really emphasized the use of the Bible to figure life out. Uh, let me give you one. I grew up, we, I went to church on, on Sundays and stuff like that, but we also went to church on Wednesdays as a kid growing up. In fact, I, I would play sports, and if sports conflicted with church, guess who won? Uh, church did. So I would show up sometimes on Wednesday nights in my baseball uniform. Either I was coming or going, but I, and sometimes if one didn't work out, it was church. So I... I I'm not going to put this on for those of you who wonder. Some of you think, oh, he was a Boy Scout. Nope, not a Boy Scout. I start fire with gasoline. So <laughs> so uh, this was a, a program I was a part of where we would earn, we would earn these, these pins and stuff like that. And my mom found this not too long ago. But I grew up in an environment where I would I spend a lot of time at church, not just on Sundays, but Wednesdays, learning what the Bible had to say. From very, I was way little. And we were learning uh, to read, but also learning to memorize scripture, learning what God had to share with us through the Bible. So you need to know that because what I'm going to share with you has been influenced by that, that from a very young age, uh, the Bible was not an unfamiliar book that sat on a bookshelf or was a giant book on a coffee table for us. Uh, We had those, but that was not the only thing that it was. The Bible was not just for the pastor guy to one day tell us what it meant. And the rest of the week we never visited. I grew up where you open that thing up you read it, you learned it, you memorized it. It was essential to life. My dad has continued this trend. Uh, this is one of my dad's old Bibles. Uh, it has his name on there. And the reason we have it is because he began a tradition, not super long ago, but he began a tradition where my dad, uh, he's a pastor, he would read the Bible, read it from beginning to end, not like just in one year, but he would read the whole thing. And then now he, 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 he oh man alive. I hate wasps so much. Did you get them? Tell me, did you just eat that wasp? No, you didn't. This is one of those days. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. My dad has started giving us, I say us, the grandkids. We get skipped now. Uh, these are Bibles that my dad read in, and I don't know that you can pick this up on, on camera, but there were places he had underlined and, and, and other places where he wrote notes and things like that. And uh, so now my kids get a, have a Bible that maybe right now they don't, they're like, it's King James, I don't understand what it says kind of stuff, but, but they'll get to see where Papa uh, made notes and what, what meant a lot to Papa. I just, you need to know this. This is the family I come from. That, that not only did we learn the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Just like we planned. The Bible is a powerful book. And alive. <sighs> you have no idea how bad my attention span is. And so... Uh, it's fine, it's fine. So, I grew up in a family, this is eating up my time. I grew up in a family that not only did we learn that the Bible was important, but you need to know that I was encouraged to do my own investigative work on the Bible. So that continued. I was called to be a pastor, which was weird to me because I didn't want to be a pastor. I definitely never wanted to talk in front of people. And I always felt overwhelmed by telling anyone else what this said because I struggled to understand what this said. So we find ourselves in an ironic situation right now. I'm talking to you, telling you what this says. 
But I grew up where there was a phase in my life, which was good, where I began to look at, well, why? Why the Bible? My parents said that I should read the Bible. I go to church, talks about the Bible. They always open up the Bible. I had multiple Bibles, some I used, some that were more like you just carried it to church and some you actually read. So here's what I want to do. This sermon is very simple. This is going to be a bit of an anchor point. I'm going to give you so much information, it's borderline ridiculous. And I'm not even going to have time to give you all of the information, especially if there's more wasps that show up. But, but I'm going to give you, here's three questions. Here's what we're going to be doing today. And this, is, I think, is helpful. What is the Bible? What did Jesus think about the Bible? And what should I know about the Bible? This will be a sermon you likely will have to come back to and watch it again. I'm going to tell you a ton of stuff. We're going to go through fast. And this is, uh, this is essential because you need to know what kind of church you're part of. You need, to, you need to know because some of you will not want to be a part of our church after we get done with the sermon. Because you're going to understand how this church looks at the Bible, uses the Bible, and, and needs the Bible. And sometimes you're like, well, I don't like that. But, so we're well, obviously going to start off with what is the Bible, and I'm going to give you not even the beginner's course, like the, the opening forward to a beginner's course of the Bible. The Bible is a library. That's what you need to know. Very simple. This book is a library. Let me show you. a. I got a list somewhere back there in space. Can you, can you give us? No? All right. I'll read it to you. Oh, okay. Here we go. The Bible is a library. It's 66 books. 66 books inside of a book. We call this a book, right? I know you call it a book. It is a book. You can keep calling it a book. But sometimes it's best to think of it as a library. It's a library of 66 books. You might even get into the details. Some of them are letters, not books, but we call them books. It's broken up into two pieces. By the way, I'm not going to read all of this. I I hated it when teachers did that. I can read it myself, right? The, The Bible is broken up into two pieces, two primary pieces, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some people go the old part and the new part. That's that's a little deeper than that. Uh, The Old Testament is is full of incredible history, and and it's a precursor. It's it's, it's the larger side. But then then all of a sudden, the whole Bible, it it feels like it shifts subject matter, and it goes into the New Testament. All this stuff about Jesus and the church starts to show up. It, It turns at the life of Jesus. We use terms like the Gospels, the four Gospels, the good news, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's when you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John start talking to us about Jesus. And then the rest of the Bible is all about the the early church and and all a bunch of other stuff. It's really incredible. But that's how your Bible, the Bible, whether it's a digital Bible or a paper Bible, or maybe you're at home and you still have the scrolls and you read it from the original language. Uh, It's That's the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. It's full of all kinds of literature. Some people will say, well, I don't like the Bible because, you know, Human beings have put stuff in it. You're right. Like, like chapters and verses. Yes. Originally, they, they weren't there, the chapters and verses. But when the Bible began to get printed and, and when it began to be accessible to people like you and I, we couldn't just say, hey, go like two-thirds of the way into the Bible and then make a little left turn. And then No. It was easier to say, go to this particular chapter. Then someone was like, how about verses two? And so chapters and verses were added in later. And it helps. So I can tell you, hey, go to John 3, 16 or this and that. It's like, a, like instead of saying, hey, I live on the whatever side of town, I can tell you a street and a, and a number. And it's so much easier. It's the most translated book in the world. This is an interesting book because if you don't know this, a lot of countries teach other people how to read using the Bible because it got translated into their language. So one of the efforts, if you don't know this, one of the efforts still going on to this day, you know, all languages do not have access to the Bible because they don't have it in their own language. So even as a church, we've been a part of helping fund get, getting the word of God, not into English, so someone has to learn English in order to read the Bible, but into that language of that group of people so they can open up and read the Bible. Okay, we got to keep rolling. The, there's uh, multiple authors. I think this is a big deal. Uh, human authors and one divine author. Yes. Sometimes, again, I'm just bringing it up. Sometimes we say, yeah, it was written by people. You, you better believe it. That, that's written by people. 40. Across 1,500 years. That's a, that's a long time to, to put together one big book. 1,500 years being written and, and different people in different continents. Do you understand how difficult it would be to actually make this cohesive? If you've got over 40 human beings from different locations across 1,500 years putting this together, if it's a conspiracy theory, you it's the best conspiracy theory ever done. That's what you got to understand. The details of the Bible aren't simply like, well, this is just a group of people got into a room and was like, no. Just by the history of it, we begin to kind of be 
wowed by it. There's four ways to translate the Bible. Because you might think, well, David reads from this version, but the words he reads are different than mine. Is, is my Bible the right Bible or the wrong Bible? Let, let's do a little quick here. Uh, uh, there's a word for word. Some of you have a, what's called the version of the Bible. It got translated into English. It did not start off in English. I don't mean to break your heart, but uh, it didn't. There's Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. Originally, that's how it was written. And so in translating that into English, you know that our language is weird. Most of us learn that in school enough going, this is weird, teacher, this doesn't make sense. Why that word is spelled that way, but sounds this way. Or, well, in Greek is just one example. Greek has a ton of different words for love. You and I have one. So I can tell you, I love donuts and I love Katie. They're not equal. I just want you in case you're worried about us, Right? <laughs> But if you don't know me, on paper, they're equal. You see, there's a breakdown in translation. So there are word for word, where you can get the word for the word, word, like exactly what was originally written. You can get an English version of exactly what was written. I've given you some ideas just for you, word for word. That's not bad. By the way, you're like, is that bad? No, it's not bad. It's good. I've got some of these. But then there's also thought for thought. And instead of word for word, because word for word can sometimes, you can lose what the writer was actually trying to communicate. You can have thought for thought where here was the main thought and and the the translators made sure that you and I got the thought. I often preach from this kind of a translation. The NIV or the NLT, it's thought for thought. There's paraphrases. The message is probably one of the most popular. It's where you read it and you're like, finally someone speaks your language. If you've ever read the message, you're like, oh my goodness. It's not word for word. And so it's kind of dangerous to do word studies with it. To read Psalms with the message, it's like the Bible comes alive at times and you're like, that's what it meant? Like, oh my goodness. But it's paraphrased. Just like if you word for word detailed your day versus if you paraphrase the day, most of us really get an idea of your day if you paraphrase it, right? Now there's also, and I'm not listing them all, there are corrupted translations of the Bible. There are versions of the Bible out there that have cut things out. Uh, I gave you one, it's what the Jehovah Witnesses use, where they have removed things because it doesn't fit along with their narrative. And so you need to be careful. You don't just go pick up any Bible on any shelf and say, well, this is called the Bible, so it must be the Bible. Be careful. That's a short class that I had to spend months on. So there you go. Manuscripts. Let's talk about the manuscripts. Uh, the, the Bible is the most trustworthy ancient book that we have. Regarding a book on antiquity, a, a book that talks about history that you and I never experienced, when you look at the criteria that our current history books have to have in order for our kids to have them in class versus the criteria for this Bible, uh, the criteria for the Bible is much more difficult to get through. Our history books that are given our kids don't have to go through near the hoops. This is so trustworthy. Archaeology continues to dig things up and say, well, that said that. Yeah, yeah, that's how that works, because it's true. Let me give you a little bit of an example if you don't know how, because this is often, if you go to too many blogs on the internet, you're going to read some crazy untruths. But how did we get the original? Because you're know, like, oh, David, 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 David. That's not the original. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you, this is not the original Bible. If so, I would not be holding it. Uh, This is not the original. But let me tell you a little bit of how they used to do this. They would have a senior scribe. The senior scribe would get up in front of other scribes and would out loud read the scripture. Would out loud on a scroll, read the scripture. And the the scribes would sit there and would, would write, would copy literally exactly word for word everything that that senior scribe was saying because they're making copies. They didn't have a printing press or a copy machine. So they're like, we've got we've to write this word for word. And they would do that all day long. You can go study these folks, especially if you go to Israel. And you study them and see that they were so spiritually devoted to this, this, this act that they would be baptized before and after they would even do it. It was, it was not a, a, a clock in, clock out kind of a thing. They'd get done with the end of the day and those, what they had copied would get checked, right? That's what you do. If you're a good teacher, you're like, 
I thought I saw you not paying attention there, right? And, and so they would check. If I, I could never do this. Five minutes in, I'd be like, what would you, you say? Go back a few lines. I don't know if I got that, right? If you're copying word for word. They would check those scrolls. If there was even one, one, if there was just one error that you made all day long, one, they would take your scroll. Thank you so much for your contribution today. They would take your scroll and they would burn it. And you would start over and hopefully you did better the next day. If you want to know the lengths that they went to to make sure that you and I got the real one. You need to know this kind of stuff because you and I need to know, despite what some people have opinions about, this is trustworthy, it's a big deal, and you and I should be opening this up and reading it. Now, the New Testament, the Old Testament, you're like, feels very historical, and then you get to the New Testament, you're like, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stuff about Jesus is pretty cool. But then a guy named Paul starts writing a bunch of stuff. You'll hear a lot about Paul get mentioned in church. Paul, you're like, who's this Paul guy? Well, Paul wrote 13, maybe 14. We're not sure, so let's be conservative because we're South Dakotans. 13. We, we give him 13. 13 books in the New Testament, 13 to 14. And like, he gets a lot of the New Testament. And you're like, who, like, who anointed Paul to be able to write stuff for the Bible? Because he would send letters to churches. Well, we got to talk about Peter. Peter was considered, appointed by Jesus to be uh, kind of like the head guy. You can read in scripture how Jesus does this, but what we believe is when, it, when Jesus was gone and all of a sudden the church is getting led, that people look to Peter for the senior leadership. Well, Peter writes this, and we got this in the Bible. He writes the same way in all of his letters. He's talking about Paul. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters, talking about Paul, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. <laughs> Just stop for a moment and find some peace in that. Peter, Peter, who walked with Jesus, is commenting on what Paul has put in, like, in letter forms. And he's going, yeah, wow, man. I don't know what you're saying, dude. This is weighty, right? You and I, should, when we, if you read the Bible and you're like, huh, I don't know what that means. Welcome to some good company. I love how he says this. He's, his letter contains some things that are, that are hard to understand. And many of us rejoice going, yes. Uh, okay. uh, which, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures. So Peter has just referred to the letters of Paul as scriptures by referring to the other scriptures, which you begin to wonder, why does Paul get so many letters in there? The early church, Peter himself going, those are scriptures. Hold on to them as holy scriptures. Now, there's a deeper lesson here. Do you know that the Bible is full of jacked up people? Right? No cheering for that one. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I mean, when you read the Bible, one of the crazy things about the Bible, because most like religions don't do this. Most religions kind of like cover stuff up and, and make it all kind of a little bit like more polished. Uh, the Bible is like, so, uh, we're going to start off about the third chapter uh, telling you like how we just screw up. And then over and over and over, there's stuff in the Bible that you got to be careful about when you're going to read that to your kids. Because you're like, do I want to have that conversation right now? The Bible does not gloss over things. The Bible tells us stories. In fact, sometimes mis we misrepresent the Bible and be we, the Bible says it. So we think the Bible condones it. No, 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 no. The Bible's honest about it. But it wasn't condoning all of history, but it's telling us what's gone and what's played before us. So when the Bible begins to help us see some things that you and I need to hear today, Peter, Peter extremely jacked up. If you don't know anything about Peter, Peter promises to Jesus that he would be willing to die for Jesus. And within 24 hours, he denies even knowing Jesus three different times within a hearing distance where Jesus could hear that. Peter notoriously overstepped his bounds all the time. Peter was known as a bit of a loudmouth at times. Peter has a church named after him in Israel, and it's not a compliment because it's all about how he denied Jesus and where he denied Jesus, and they said, let's put a church there. That's a church I don't want in my name at all, right? Then you've got Paul. Paul wrote a ton of the New Testament. It's in there. Paul, was Paul a perfect guy? No, Paul, known by our standards, would have been considered a terrorist. Paul spent many years killing and imprisoning Christians because they were Christians. Yet in the Bible, God does perfect work through imperfect people. 
So if your problem with the Bible is that imperfect people help put it together, then you don't know God yet. And I want you to know who God is. God wants to use you no matter who you are, where you come from, no matter what you know or how good you've been. God loves you so much. It does not matter how perfect you've been or imperfect you've been. We believe wholeheartedly the Bible is one example, one of many examples, that God uses imperfect people all the time to do perfect work. One of the reminders of why you and I need to open up the Bible and look at what really is honestly done, we get encouragement going, if God can use that person who did that thing, then oh my goodness, maybe I've got some hope. This is one of those, this is why we should be in the Bible. Many of us are not encouraged in our faith these days because we're not reading the Bible. And it's not that you uh, gloat in the midst of someone's mistakes, but we kind of get a little encouragement that God can take someone who doesn't know a whole lot, who's not doing a lot of great things, and God says, I can use you, I can use you, I can use you. The book of Judges is fantastic for that. So, with all of that said, (laughs) what about Jesus? What did Jesus think about the Bible? If you don't like the Bible because it's got some grammatical errors or you think it's an old, old thing and like, well, I, I would never use it. You know what, David? David, I just like Jesus. Jesus is my guy. I like Jesus. Well, let's talk about Jesus. And let's see if Jesus, well, let's just see what Jesus thought about the Bible. What Step one, Jesus used the Bible to resist temptation. He, right here, Matthew 4. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written. Interesting. Again, some of us, this is the only part of the sermon we need. You're like, you've been fighting temptation? You ever, no, I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you've ever fought temptation. I'm going to guess that's, oh, yep, you fought temptation. It's, it's, it's time enough. You fought temptation at some point today. When you fight temptation, Jesus is going, okay, we're going to war right now against the devil? Jesus says, here's how I go to war against the devil. I use this. And he goes in, he goes, it is written. Then you go to the, uh, the next temptation, uh, verse 7. Jesus answered, it is also written. He doesn't even just do it one time. He's like, all right, you said that, Satan? Here's what the Bible says. Matthew 4.10, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Some of us, that's all we need. We're like, all right, I don't read the Bible. It's confusing. But if Jesus was fighting temptation, if there's any kind of trap that you've given into in your life, if there's any kind of sin, you're like, I want this out of my life. I don't want this to have victory over me. Jesus would say, well, I used it to fight that temptation. So one reason, if that's all you need, is open up the Bible to learn how to defeat the lies of the devil. Jesus used the Bible also to teach truth. In his most popular sermon, um, he preached a lot, but in his most popular sermon, Matthew 5 through 7, he quotes eight passages from what you and I would know as the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus literally quoted scripture why did he quote scripture? So that people would know truth. Let's, let's dive into this for a little bit. Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Notice what Jesus is doing here. Let the reader understand. Notice when Jesus is teaching and talking to folks, he has a tendency to allude to the fact that you are a reader and not just like a reader of the internet. (laughs) He's referring to a reader of this. Over and over, you're gonna learn if you study the life of Jesus, if you don't like the Bible and all this kind of stuff or Christianity or religion or or organized religion and all that kind of stuff, and you're like, I just, I'm I'm a Jesus guy, I love Jesus. Jesus over and over would teach truth and he would allude to it and so you better be reading this. Matthew uh, 19. Haven't you read? Well, there's an assumption right there. Uh, Haven't you read? Uh, You know what he's doing here? He was asked about marriage. I I know marriage, that conversation nowadays, we don't even talk about, I'm just joking. That's pastor sarcasm. I'm not supposed to do sarcasm. Uh, So do you know that people nowadays care about marriage, care about what it is, what it isn't, all that kind of stuff, even where the government has gotten involved. Jesus was asked about marriage. They asked him about, about ending marriage. Like, hey, can you end it? Can you stop it? Well, what happens if you do end it? And all that kind of stuff. He got, he got asked all the time about marriage. Do you note how Jesus responds to the marriage question? Not with, well, my opinion is, or in this situation, or I know what Moses said that's no longer relevant anymore. I've got a new thing for you. No, when he's asked about marriage, he leads with, haven't you read? He leads with, 
So the Bible says, and it's still true to this day, when you and I are dealing with stuff in life that is very complicated these days, especially culturally, and you want an answer for it, please don't just go to Google. Copy Jesus. We say, oh, you got a question about that? Okay, well, I bet it's, it's been written about, so let's go find out. Matthew 24. We'll go back to Matthew 24. As it was in the days of Noah. So Jesus is talking about Noah. So it will be on the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, do, you, do you see assumption he made? He's talking to a group of people, talking about Noah, the flood, and the ark. And he does not say, oh, you guys haven't heard that one yet? He's talking to a group of people who have heard the story of the flood. And Jesus is referring to it, that he knows that through song and through scripture, they know this information. Jesus used the Bible to demonstrate who he is. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Talking about what a scripture contains full, all that information. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have come to fulfill them. He's using things that are written in scripture saying, I've come to fulfill that. This stuff is what got him killed when he began to let people know, I am the Messiah. And he would use scripture to example that. I know it's a ton of information, ton of information. You're like, you're right, you said there's gonna be a ton of it. It's a ton of information. We got more to go to. Third question. Uh, third question, and this is, I think, where we get maybe a personal um, approach here. What should I know about the Bible? If, okay, if it's a great book historically, if Jesus used it, okay, then Pastor David, um, what, what should I know about the Bible? Step one, the Bible is God-breathed. I know that's not language that you and I have a tendency to use, like God breathed. That means it, it comes from the mouth of God. The word of, the, word of, the word of God, the Bible, comes from the mouth of God. In fact, everyone who wants to be, li uh, live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But it's for you. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now stop. Some of you are like, I have not from infancy <laughs> been taught like Pastor David who earned medals or all that kind of stuff, right? You're right? Like, I have not. Well, that's a good example of why you need to get your kids in the kids' ministry. It's also a good example. If you didn't learn those things in infancy, go serve in the kids' ministry. You'll learn them in your adulthood. Anyways, uh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then where I get the God-breathed part, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture comes from the mouth of God. Do you, do you see the word all? That should mess with some of us. Do you know that some of even our forefathers, some of our forefathers would, would cut out portions of the Bible because it revealed supernatural work of God that they couldn't get their minds wrapped around, so they cut that out. All. All, all scripture, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching. Now, let me read this in a way I, this should help us understand. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching. All scripture is God breathed and useful for rebuking. All scripture is God breathed and useful for correcting. All scripture is God breathed and useful for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, I can help you translate this. If you want to do all of the good works that God has in store for you specifically to do, you need to get in here because you need this. So do I in order to be equipped, equipped to do some of the good. Some of us are doing the good and we're ill-equipped for it. And so we're doing it for the wrong reasons and the wrong ways. And we're setting ourselves up for failure. Let's keep going. The Bible is the infallible word of God. Infallible, again, not a word that we use all the time, but it's important to understand. If you look up the word infallible in English, you're even gonna get some bad definitions. Here, Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect. I've already told you that the Bible has some grammatical errors in it. So am I lying? Did I forget? Maybe this is just a badly, poorly written sermon where I've forgotten, oops, oh no, I didn't mean to say that. It says perfect, but 
But their understanding for perfect is different than your and my understanding of perfect. When you and I say perfect, we think absolutely, exactly without error in any kind of way whatsoever. No mistakes, no grammatical errors. They're no perfect or infallible for them would have been it's accomplished what was intended to be accomplished. It's complete. It's mature. It's right. The Bible is the infallible word of God. In other words, the Bible is exactly what God wanted it to be and in your hands. This is not different than what God wanted it to be. That's important to understand because as you're studying the Bible and reading the Bible, you're like, is this what God wants me to read? Uh Uh-huh. And what they're saying is the law of the Lord is exactly what God wants it to be and he wants it in your hands so that you can actually do life as you're supposed to. And once you understand that, you understand the Bible holds authority. This is what our current culture does not like, authority. I don't like authority, frankly. Uh, I prefer to make all the decisions and be in charge of everything all the time. You might feel that way. Uh, Some of you are like, no, no, never. But typically we all like authority, especially when it's very personal. The Bible holds authority. Matthew 4, 4, I already read this to you, but it is written. You notice how Jesus attacks Satan going, I hear what you're saying, but let me talk to you about what holds authority. And he quotes what has authority. One of the life's biggest issues right now in our world is we're trying to love God yet not let him be our authority. You know what the hardest thing is about following Jesus? Letting him be in control all the time. The hardest thing about the Bible is when you open it up some days and you read something, you're like, wait a minute. That means I might have to change some ways that I think, some ways that I might have to behave. That might reconstruct a little bit about how I function in life. And then you have the choice, who has authority? Isaiah Isaiah spoke about this. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I sent it. God sent it. It has authority. This is why I tried to set you up in a good way, but I'm going to remind you, this may not be the right church for you. I would love for you to be a part of this church. But the way that I'm going to preach, the emphasis we're going to have as a church, this holds authority. And you got to know that's annoying some days, but it's helpful and life-giving. This has authority. Culture does not. Our emotions do not. Our desires do not have authority. The word of God holds authority, which means you need to know something else. The Bible points to Jesus. If you don't know this, you've never been taught this, the whole Bible has been pointing to Jesus the entire time. John 5, 39, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. They are the very scriptures that testify about me. He's saying this whole thing has been pointing to Jesus. If you look at the Old Testament, the whole thing points to a need for the Messiah and begins to even provide prophecies about the arrival of Jesus. If you've never studied the prophecies about Jesus, about where he would be born and all the facets around that, it's insane what was said about him before he even shows up. It's all pointing to Jesus. Then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the beginning of the New Testament is all about Jesus. Then the rest of it still continues to point to Jesus and the spread of his good news. The whole thing, the whole thing. This is why we don't throw out the Old Testament and say that's just old stuff. And then perhaps the best part, the Bible is transformative. If you want to know why we as a church, every time we gather, every time we gather, we make sure that we open up the word of God. It's because it is transformative. For the word of God is alive and active. You're like, I've never seen my Bible move. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Yeah, no, no. Again, see how they spoke in ways that are a little different than you and I do? Like word, word for word. You're like, no, no. This thing, when you read this, I know it looks like paper. Or for you, maybe digital screen. When you read it, it's not just words from some book that some have liked and it's got some good moral truths to it. It's the word of God holding the authority of God, the power of God. So if you read this and apply it, it will transform your very life. 
It doesn't just leave you just stagnant and apathetic. This is why when churches die, when Christians leave God, it's not because something changed from God. It's they left the word of God and refused to let him transform their very souls. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Do you know why some people don't like the Bible? Because it judges our stinking attitudes. If you need me to be, be, I'm always honest with you, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to be super honest with you. When I read the Bible, it often goes right after my attitude. And I'm like, oh man, I should have read this later after I got to say what I wanted to say. So maybe a, a lesson here before we use the Bible as binoculars. We need to use it as a mirror. A lot of times we look at life and other people through the Bible. In fact, we oftentimes, and we're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to judge non-Christians or non-believers at the same standard, but we often look at the world and government and politicians and all that, and, and, we, and we look at other people and friends and family and coworkers and, and people at school and all that. We look, and, and I'm not saying you can't look at the world through the lens of the Bible, but according to the Bible, it starts with as a mirror where you look at it and say, Lord, speak to my soul before I confront anyone else's soul. I bet by the looks of you, you looked in a mirror today. Some of you may not have. You're just that majestic. Good job. Most of us would never leave the house with glancing at some sort of a reflection to at least make sure we don't look like fools. The Bible is designed to be a mirror for your soul. Yet so many Christians refuse to look in it to see what's really going on. I encourage you, this sermon is an anchor point. Go visit it if you want to know what we're going to do with the rest of the year and what we're going to do as long as I'm pastor of the church is we're going to keep opening this. You're like, okay, I want to read the Bible. Good for you. We're going to keep reading it, looking at it, and studying it. So here, one last, one, one last thing. I just think this is important as a statement, a bit of an anchor as a church. We will teach from the Bible, and you need to know that. And we're going to do our very best to not put opinion in it. And I, like I try to do every time, if I ever tell you my opinion, I tell you I'm going to tell you my opinion. <laughs> But we're going to do our very best to, to open up the word of God and tell you what the Bible says. I am not perfect. I know you are well aware of that, but I just need to say it. None of us who ever preach are ever perfect. We're trusting in the Holy Spirit to correct anything we do wrong. But we will teach from the Bible. And what that means is be teachable, read it, listen to it, meditate on it, ask questions about it, memorize it, and teach it. That last part, you're like, I'm glad you put that at the end. Mm. No. If you have a family at home, roommates at home, anybody, you should be opening up the Bible at least for a little bit each day. Read it. If it confuses you, guess what? There's people around you to help you understand what it says. Do not treat confusion as an excuse to never go into the Word of God. Confusion should actually be a motivation to go into the Word of God because the more that you read, the more you understand it. So, not warm and fuzzy, but... Your application, if you want to know more about the Bible that we just talked about and clarified on, I can't wait to see you for the next 10 to 20 years as we look at what the Bible has to say, what God has to say for our very own souls so that we follow him like true followers of Jesus Christ as true disciples. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I can't actually imagine life without what I have learned from your word. God, I know you're capable of, you, you could have done it another way if you wanted to. But God, we're grateful for it. Lord, would you help each and every one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ or those who are even skeptics? God, would you encourage us to get into your word, to ask you questions, to learn about you, to let your mirror show us what we need to see. God, may we be a church that all the way to the point of the return of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would find us in your word, worshiping you, learning about you, and sharing with others all that we've learned in it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.